Good tactical sense. Why to keep people on a need to know basis? Now, this is the Grown Black Folks Talk, and we're going to start it in the festive mood we've been in. I mentioned to you that, you know, the two videos ago made it to 500 subscribers, 521 subscribers. It's now 523. So thank you for the two that have come along since then. And also that five subscriber 521 had joined after having used my social media to vet me, which means that really does happen. And so now I am now vetting a whole project that I made initial contact, got vetted, got given permission to see the information and we're going from there, but I haven't shared a lot about it. And I've said before, tell people what you're doing, give people details about what you're doing when it's done or whether you're at a stage where it cannot be messed in. I've said this twice on this channel at least. And both times I was wearing this shirt. So we're gonna stay with the theme <laughs> for a little while because this is gonna take a grim turn later on. This is grown black folks talk, right? This, this, this conversation is for grown, grown people. Now, if you are a member of another race, there are gonna be wrinkles that apply to your in-group specifically, but there are also African-American wrinkles that apply for the African-American in-group. And so I'm gonna talk about that, but many of you who are well-informed already know about it. And to my black listeners, African-American listeners, everybody else already knows our stats. And they're not good on a lot of things. But this is another reason why we deal with a need to know basis. Now that's a concept that comes from the military. My father's a military veteran. A lot of the black men elders that I work with are military veterans. And I've absorbed a lot of that and I've studied the military. One of the ways that a military is successful and arguably the United States Armed Forces is for the last century and a half, arguably the most successful military on earth arguably. Now, in context of world history, there are a lot of wars that have been fought. We can go back and forth about it, but arguably the United States Armed Forces are the most successful military organization on earth. So there's got to be something we can learn about why this is. One of the reasons that this is, is because of the control of information. If your enemies know what you're going to do before you do it, you're going to lose a lot because they then can protect your movements and they can prepare to overcome you. So one of the ways this is kept from happening is what's called need to know basis. Your rank in the military reflects a couple of things, your training, your experience, and the level of responsibility you are judged by the military is carrying. So a need to know basis basically is people have the information they need to carry out their level of responsibility. No more and no less. Now, the commander in chief of all United States Armed Forces is Mr. Joseph Robinette Biden, sitting president of the United States. And when it comes to the activity of the armed forces inside the country and in the world, because you do have Coast Guard and National Guard, in addition to the Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marines, who operate everywhere in the world, well, pretty much everywhere, but I mean around the world. The level of information that he has to have is greater than let's say two steps down as president, the top generals, generals in general, <laughs> pardon the pun, and a colonel. There, there's a universal difference. And then there's an even bigger universe between a colonel and a private. But all of them have a level of information. They have a similar pool of information, but as the unit gets smaller in the force that the person is serving in, you know, an admiral, then you got the Navy, so you got admirals and commodores. As the unit gets smaller, the amount of information gets smaller for each person operating in it, because the point is, everyone knows what they need to do to uphold a common mission. And that is the foundation of the need to know basis. Because if you have too many people knowing everything about what you're doing, this gives you an opportunity to leak a lot of things. Rank and file officers are the most common people to be captured. They're supposed to give name, rank, and serial number, and they're not supposed to have in their heads too much about the bigger strategy. So you don't burden the private with information about the strategy. And thus you do not imperil the army by too many people having information they cannot be held responsible, properly responsible for because experience, training, and level of responsibility is not there. 
Now, I've greatly simplified this, of course. I'm a veteran's daughter. I'm not in the military. If any veteran wants to add context to what I'm saying and more specific knowledge, of course, you are absolutely welcome to do that. I have generalized it for a civilian audience as a civilian, but I respect the fact there may be things that I'm overlooking. In the civilian world, and one of the reasons it's easy to overlook it is because we all know people that have titles that have nothing to do with their experience, their training, or their level of responsibility. They have that title because of a friend. Civilian life is not as ordered, nor does it have that kind of hierarchy, which is also one of the reasons why it's very difficult sometimes to adjust from being in the military where these things are pretty much taken for granted to civilian life because things don't match up like that. Nonetheless, if you look at people who are very effective in getting things done, you'll find out, as I see in my own community, a lot of those people are military and they come together and they operate by these principles and they get things done. A YouTuber that I often mention on my channel, Stephanie Perry, is a veteran. And she talks sometimes about the things she learns in the military about you're not given information. This is the other side of the need to know. You're not given information for you to just have it. You're given information that you're supposed to execute, act on. You receive it, you act on, you debrief. You talk about what worked and what didn't. Receive, execute, debrief. That's a very useful concept. That's another video. And besides, she did it better than I could. But the idea about a need to know basis is you information you can act on. And in fact, that is a separate video because that's part of the concept. Everybody is given the information that they at their level of responsibility can act on. And that's it. This is something that you need to consider applying in your own life. What's your mission? And is it important enough so that you need to consider carefully who needs to know what you're doing? Now, let me start this from a Christian perspective, okay? Now, some of you don't believe this, but we're going to put it out there. There is one person that knows everything about what you're about to do before you even think about doing it. And he's about the only person that needs to have that kind of access anyway. Seriously. Because we have all been on social media and you're watching this on YouTube and this is a form of social media, of course, we are very used to the idea that a lot of people have access to the things that we are doing, and a lot of people have access to our lives. Jo Dr. John Henry Clark said this in another context, but it is still correct. He said about Black people in the world, given the history of the world and how the building of the fundamental capital required that Black people be enslaved, not just in the European world, but in the Arab world before that. And if you cover the Arab world, then you also are including the Asian world with that. And then many of you don't know it, but Native Americans had slaves as well. Therefore, based on this information, Dr. John Henry Clark said, you as a black person have no friends. I am going to say that you have no friends on social media unless these are actual people that you are actually your friends that you've taken time to vet and build relationships with. What you have is pixels and binary code saying that there's a number and a heart and a light. That's light moving on the screen. You may have 200, 300, 5,000, 10,000, 100,000 followers calling themselves friends according to a certain algorithm. You don't know them. They don't need access to everything that you're doing. And among your friends that you think you have, do you know why all the people, are, if you're someone who has a lot of people around you, do you know why? Have you vetted them? Have you spent time with them to know that they are loyal, that they are people of good character, that they are people of good morals, that they are people who are emotionally intelligent? that they are people who have developed their intellect well enough to understand what it is that you're doing. Because the last grim side of what I'm about to say next is this. People believe very much about crowdfunding and the wisdom of the crowd. But the wisdom of a crowd only works if you want the crowd's results. If you're going to do a social media post about I'm about to go to Club X or Church X, depending on what realm of the Black community you live in, 
you know, that's there's plenty of people doing it. But if you have been called to do something different or you have ideas or have created intellectual properties or you have artistic skill in a certain area and, and you get offered a chance to do something that most people are not going to get a chance to do, the wisdom of the crowd is going to fail you because the crowd in the United States of America is not doing that. I'm not just talking about the Black community. I'm just talking about the average crowd as a consumer crowd, not a producer crowd. People can mean well and give you advice to mess up your life. You out here looking for the wisdom of the crowd. If you are a Christian, the Bible also says the wisdom of man is foolishness with God. So you are never going to be able to go to the crowd. Nine tenths of which is not saved. According to the latest data. And have any and then the one tenth that is doesn't know you and doesn't know what God shared with you and doesn't know where you are in your walk with Christ. So generalized as well as Christian, what you want to do is go to people that are, are fellow travelers and what you are doing and can be wise mentors that have what have we talked about in terms of rank, training, experience, and a level of responsibility. And you want to vet their results before you get advice from them. It's like, y'all need to get advice from me about the best kind of forklift to buy. I can't help you with that. But there are people in a number of industries who move major goods of different kinds, who can tell you? Because someone might be thinking about, I need one that rides smooth because I move, move things that are fragile. I need this is really strong because I move this. You need to have people who are around it. You need, I'm about to start a business. What kind of forklift would you recommend? I'm about to start making forklifts. Even within that generalized idea, there are different kinds of people that you need to talk to than the average crowd. Again, the American crowd in general is a consumer crowd not a producer crowd. So if you're going to do anything that is creative, if you're building anything, you need to be in a group of people that are doing that thing. And the person who builds a forklift is not the same one who knows how to build a, a, a who knows how to build fireworks on Apple Fices 209, which is the program in which I made these fireworks. I can show you how to get a relatively good idea of how to use fractal geometry in a program to do that. If you need to build a better mousetrap, I can't do anything for you, but I might be out there in that crowd running my mouth because that's what I do. You notice? You don't need everybody's opinions. You need to go to mentors wise counsel and fellow travelers who are on a journey, but maybe a little bit ahead of you. And then you turn around and help that next fellow traveler who's behind you. But you don't need to hear from everybody about what you're doing. This is not counting all the people that don't want you to make it because they feel like for whatever reason, if you're making it and they're not, that makes them uncomfortable because they may have to confront their excuses. That's in group, outside a group. Um, you may not be aware of this, but you live in a world where racism exists and it exists across more cultures than you think. Latin America has a five-step caste system if you're a black person and you are at the bottom. Asia has caste systems in which you are at the bottom. I'm not going to go into details here, but I don't have to. You can go look that up on your own. And even Native Americans, certain tribes held slaves. That should take care of it for you. Even in an integrated environment, there's still going to be people outside the community that feel like if you advance as a Black person, they may have to become part of the permanent underclass, and you might not. So they may have to take your place. It's an irrational fear, and I'm going to get into why it's irrational in a few minutes, but it's there. And then if you're a woman, there are Black men mad right now because Goldman Sachs decided to give $10,000 in loans to 1 million black women investors. Now they had perfectly good statistical reasons for giving it to black women. We're gonna get into it in a minute. But instead of thinking, oh, okay, most black business owners are still men. So if I position myself, this capital investment coming into the black community can be very helpful. No, folks out here are doing more loud complaining than they are positioning themselves to work. Because people, again, there's uh, America has, the United States of America has a lot of opportunities for downward mobility. We've seen this since the Great Recession of 2008. A lot of people who thought they were doing just fine have moved out of the middle class into poverty. And it's very difficult to find your way back up if that happens. And so there's gonna be people around you of all races and in a random crowd, you don't know who you're talking to about what you're planning to do. So they're not qualified to give you good advice. 
And then in the people around you that actually know you, your move may be uncomfortable. Let me do a story time before I go to the more grim side of this for African-Americans. I have, if you uh, have rolled with me for a very long time, grown black folks talk used to be on Facebook. And if you look at me then and now, you've seen I've lost a significant amount of weight. There are people who are in my circle who are uncomfortable with that. Because again, if I can make that kind of transformation, remember, I'm a 41 year old post wall African American woman. I'm supposed to accept the leftovers according to the conversations that happen in many of these internet spaces. But if I improve myself, I, people feel like, you know, maybe not. Maybe Deanne is going to outcompete me for something that I want. And then maybe if Deanne can change like that, people are going to start looking at me about why I'm not. And people are insecure about different things. People build up their sense of self by comparing them to someone they think is behind them. Well, Ms. Deanne may go eat everybody's lunch because I'm a big, good looking woman. May eat everybody's lunch. May have this, that, the third, the fourth, and get the attention of some man that people think that a woman like I shouldn't be able to. So that's a big thing in a community that focuses a lot on the physical side of relationships as opposed to the spiritual, intellectual, and moral. That's a big, losing weight is a big deal for a Black woman for that reason. It's a bigger deal than it really should be, but that's just one example. You make people uncomfortable. And this is true across races. If, if you're in a circle of people that is comfortable being weak in some way, and that's almost every circle, none of us are perfect. If one person though really starts to improve, it then makes people question themselves about why they're not improving and they worry about other people questioning them. And if they're comparing themselves with that person, it messes up their own self-image. So it is better for those two reasons alone. And I could stop here, but I'm not going to. You don't have to attract that information to anyone, okay? Now, if, like I said, I could stop there, but I'm not going to. Perhaps you've seen in the news and have noticed something in the last two years. It seems to be that people in the United States, a lot of people in the United States are, I've mentioned what's happened since the Great Recession of 2008. There is a great deal of a sense that the promises of America are not being fulfilled. And some people have a great deal of disassociated frustration and even murderous rage. And it breaks out at odd times, sometimes even on little children in school, such as in Uvalde, Texas. It's a very grim thought, but you don't know who around you, because somebody's got to take the blame for person X not getting what they need. And if you live in a community where deprivation and depravity, you now human depravity, this is a Christian doctrine about the, the depth of sin capacity in every human being to do any kind of sin, things that you meet people that you wouldn't think that they would ever do, the the complete capacity for evil that human beings possess is covered in this concept. But some people are nearer to the edge than others. And if you're in a community where deprivation meets depravity at a very strong level, then we go to another level. To a point in a country that has struggled for two years in a pandemic, um, in which the economy has struck, been, been a struggle for a lot of people for a lot of years now. There's a lot of this disassociated rage. There's also just, we have a group of people who feels like whiteness isn't doing for them what it used to do. It doesn't guarantee them what it used to guarantee them. So there's a certain uptick in that. But at this point, we have to talk about the in-group reason. Um, and it's just like, if this was a, a lecture, I, you know, it's a free country. So I can't ask anybody else who may listen to this to leave the room. It just, it is what it is because this is the medium we have to work with. See, all of these things are reason for caution, but see, at this point, this is where we end up here. The 
party's over. I thought about doing a separate video about what I mean to say here, but I don't do broken news. We talked about that shortly before I had took my long COVID break. I'm not gonna just drop a piece of information on you and not put it in the context when you can do something with it. And this piece of news bolsters why it's necessary to put people on a need to know basis in your life, particularly inside the black community where deprivation meets depravity in ways that you probably have never thought about. Although, like I said, there are reasons that Goldman Sachs read the data I'm about to share with you and made decisions and why people are investing in certain elements of the black community and not in others. A black male friend and I were talking last week and we were talking about why it is so hard to solve problems in the black community and I shared with him data that I have from several years ago in which one out of every four black men is a convicted felon. Now, you don't understand the gravity of this until you really understand the 13th Amendment. The 13th Amendment abolishes slavery. It doesn't establish citizenship rights, but it abolishes slavery. It makes it so you cannot be held in slave status unless on the federal level, felony imprisonment. And there is no mechanism in the constitution to restore your rights should you fall back to slave status due to a felony conviction. There is no constitutional way back. To have a federal restoration of your rights will require another amendment, meaning that someone has to now go convince 38 states. Well, states copied this into their own constitutions. So we see votes coming up in state legislatures that will strike this clause out of their own constitutions and they keep leaving it in there. Private prison is a big, big business in the United States, big time investment. The prison is the new plantation. But the point is, even if a black man who has felony is no longer in prison, his rights have not been restored. In many states, he cannot vote. His civil rights are not present anymore. Uh, paid work, forget it. Can't get most jobs can't get many types of housing. If you can't buy it outright, you certainly can't have it. Starting many businesses, anything that requires a background check, you're not gonna pass it. And so you have been in de facto terms, you have been stripped of the rights of your citizenship. Now, the birthright citizenship remains, but on a practical level, these men do not have it. He said to me, no, nah, Deanne, that can't be right. That's got to be an overcount. So then he went and looked it up. And I've now had a chance to have it looked up by several different people and several different sources. So to make sure we're all on the same page when I say that the number is not one in four, it's one in three. 30 to 33% of Black men are convicted felons. That's the community you live in, Black folks. One sixth of every adult of all adults. And this also means that one third of all black children are growing up in households where for whatever reason, their fathers cannot provide for them what they cannot provide for themselves. Now, I work with black elders who are very much involved in um, re-entry and in restoring what rights can be restored on the state level. I'm not saying that it's absolutely hopeless. We're, I'm also not saying that all these men were convicted righteously. We know about the Central Park Five now being the exonerated five. We know about the work of the Innocence Project. We also know, like I said, private prisons are a business, which means that there are people finding ways to make sure the Black men have felonies. This has been true since 1865 because members of the slave owning class in the Southern United States set up their convict leasing programs. That was the backup before the war. If a particular slave owner didn't want to be have a particular slave on a plantation because he was troublesome, he could lend him out to the local jail who would then put him to work and pay the master for the privilege. When chattel slavery of the old style ended, they already had this as a backup plan. Something that you don't know about history, Abraham Lincoln was married to a slave owner's daughter, Ulysses S. Grant was married to a slave owner's daughter, and the most famous slave owner whoever loaned a slave, three slaves out to a convict leasing program 
was Robert E. Lee, Confederate general who surrendered. So it's not like all of them did not know what was on that table when the 13th Amendment came out. That was Abraham Lincoln's unknown olive branch to the entire slave owning class of men. It meant that they would be able, if they could find ways to make vagrancy a crime, that they could snatch up black men and black women and put them right back to work. But most labor, most hard labor could be done by the men. So we're not going to pretend that that's not happening. All those things are in play. But if you have a community where one sixth of adults have been shut out of their full American rights, more or less permanently, and then one third the children, though, are also going to be deprived of that person. That number interplays with the fact that one quarter of black women is a single mother. Now, there are non-felon men who are not upholding their responsibilities. That's not an exact overlap, but it plays into that. So now you're gonna have a lot of people growing up and they're not all five and six years old. The present sitting president set up his 1986 and 1994 crime bills to make almost identical crimes between black men and white men judged differently by a difference in the composition of cocaine, knowing that black men were selling and using crack cocaine more. 1994 was almost 30 years ago. So if you were a child of someone that was you know, caught up then, you're 28 today. Which means, ladies and gentlemen, that when you get online talking about what you're about to do, you are talking to people, you, are, you do not know who you are listening to. One sixth of the community is desperate for resources because they are being shut out of work and do not think they're not black women felons and people who have also done milder misdemeanors. So we're gonna keep it at one third for the purpose of this video, but you gotta ask yourself, that number has got to be higher than that because there's some people that just haven't gotten caught. The community tends to cover for these people. But in a community that covers for criminals and doesn't snitch, is this a community where you want everybody to know your business though? Because you have criminals and you have people covering for criminals. Then you have misdemeanors. And you just have people that haven't been caught up. This is our reality. Don't get mad. Go look it up. Your life depends on you not putting out, making yourself a target. We're not talking about now, you know, disassociated anger about not getting the American promise. We're talking about people that where deprivation and depravity meet. And I'm not just talking about the felons because not every, every felon's on that page, but you've got all these different children who are now in their twenties and thirties and they see life getting by and they can't do the things that you can do because for whatever reason, you're in a better position to do it. Do you know how dangerous that can be? We already down one third. We don't know what that other number is of desperate people. So here you are as an African-American coming out here, letting everybody know what you're about to do. And you wonder why things get blown up because that's your actual community situation. So it is very important. You see it, party's over for you to discipline yourself and put people on a need to know basis. Don't make yourself a target. It is very important that you learn how to do this because the resentment of deprivation alone that we are dealing with because of what has happened in the last 50 years to say nothing of the last 250 is huge. And because people did not have their families together, because people's families were engaging in, in all kinds of not helpful behavior and they were not allowed to develop. People are looking at, at, at they have goals and dreams and gifts that are undeveloped just sitting there tormenting them. Now, this is true in many communities. There are some communities that are now going through this because of the opiate crisis. This isn't the, the black community is not the only community to have problem, but I'm talking about grown black folks. If anybody else is in the room, go look up your community's problem. I promise you that you have them. Don't sit up there and feel like you're just better than everybody else. No, you're not. I may pull your stats one good day too. Definitely don't bring that foolishness over here, but I have to talk to you the way it is. I'm not just sitting up here talking about a need to know basis just to be talking about it. 
I'm talking about it because in real time, there are people out here who are finding out that it's people who they thought were their allies online are messing them over and not allowing, not allowing good things to happen. They don't have the friends they think they have. This has happened over and over and over and over in the past two years. Because we fail to realize the situations that we are really in. So if you are in a state of civil war, and to a certain extent, you know, a lot of people in the United States keep asking for a civil war. It's like, y'all don't even realize it's kept up on us. We got a million casualties from COVID. In a, in a country that is, you know, out here shooting up children, it's like bleeding Kansas in 1850. If you don't get control of the foolishness, you can go into actual total war. But the Civil War actually snuck up. Well, if you pay attention to what's going on in the United States, if you read about 1855 to 1860, I'm just trying to tell you, you have to operate a little bit differently. So the Lord sent a veteran's daughter to have a conversation with you about this today. There are a lot of things I do in my life that I will not present on this channel. I was just having a conversation with some, some people in a group I'm part of, and we know everything about the group of people that's causing trouble because they out here online letting it know. We just sit there reading. And this is why they know everything about my fictional work, but they know very little about my life because people collect information on them. You need to put people on a need to know basis. And whatever it is you've been given to do, you need to talk to wise mentors and fellow travelers. If you need validation, advice, support, you got to learn how to build a support network. You got to learn who the top people are in your field and get good enough at what you're doing to be among them. Time, energy, money, sacrifice may be necessary, but you cannot go out here on these internets in the United States of America the way things are now. The wisdom of a crowd isn't going to get it for you anyway, so it's not worth the risk. You really have to think to yourself, who has the experience, the training, and the levels of emotional, moral, and spiritual responsibility to be able to know what is going on with me in my life? Whose opinion is qualified? And if none of those things apply to your social media following and to your circle of friends, you in the wrong circle of people and you need to leave things off social media, you see it. As an African-American woman, I am deadly serious about this. Party's over. It's actually been over for a while. This is not a conversation I've wanted to have on this channel. But um, part of my calling is to give you what I've been given to give you. I didn't just get that piece of information about those stats just to have it. Or even to have a show we sit up and talk about it and get all upset and then talk about, well, if this is the case, then why is this happening? Why is that? No. Bet yourself. Now that you know this, I hope it encourages you to be a little bit more careful about how much you let people into your business. Go do what it is you're going to be doing. Now, I will do another video tomorrow on how the steps are that you build a supportive network. I'm not talking about divestment as the Black Women's Empowerment Movement Online talks about it, but just like, okay, if you don't feel like you have the support of the people around you, what do you do to build a better network so that you do have people you can go to? We're not meant to do this alone. I'm not saying curl up in a shell, I'm not. But what I am saying is, Broadcasting everything you're about to do is about as dumb for you as it would be for the US Armed Forces. And the stakes are exactly the same. So you have to learn how to build a more positive network. And I'll talk about that on my next video. How do you get people around you that need to know? All right, again, I apologize for the grim video, but it had to be said. And shout out to Subscriber Train Pack, for whom every now and again, I will do a longer video. All right. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you for listening, particularly if you stayed this long through this transition. Goodbye.